So I'm Alex. I'm uh, working as distribution and festivals coordinator at SDI. And um, I'm also uh, working in curation and I'm very interested in work uh, around human rights and documentary. So I'm very delighted that today uh, we are having a conversation about ethics of documentary filmmaking and especially as lockdown is eased in certain parts of the world and people might be considering getting back to filming. I think it's a, it's a very good time to actually start thinking about how to get back to work safely, but also what is our responsibility as filmmakers uh, towards the crew, the contributors, the audience, as well as to ourselves, our families. Um, so I'm very happy to uh, have this discussion today with Elum Shakarifar. She's a BAFTA nominated producer, um, winner of the 2017 Women in Film and TV, BBC Factual Award, and she works, uh, she has worked in, uh, as a producer for several um, internationally acclaimed documentaries from, made all over the world. Uh, so I'm really excited to, to discuss some of these um, ethical questions and principles with her. Um, but also we will uh, draw on some of the key points uh, from the Doc Society recently published guidelines. Uh, it's called Filming in the Time of Corona. And I will post that link uh, in the chat um, box so you, you have it there as well. Um, and hopefully by the end of this, um, this talk, we will feel a bit more confident or know a bit more what to expect and how to go back into uh, the sort of new normal um, that we're all <laughs> uh, talking about these days. Uh, so uh, without further ado, I would like uh, to invite Elum to uh, just start by telling us a bit more about yourself, your organization, um, and how lockdown affected your work. Oh, well, hi everyone, and thanks so much, SDI, for inviting me for coffee this morning. Um, I don't really know where to look, so I'm, yeah, I'm putting on speaker view so I can see just less people. I am, um, so I run a, a small production company called Hakwati. Hakwati means the storyteller in Arabic. And uh, the kind of core ethos is that a good story is in the telling and that the stories we tell uh, say something about the world that we want to live in and say something about us. And so it speaks already to the responsibility of, um, of filmmaking and, and the stories you decide to, to make. We also curate and distribute. So think about how there's a, story, there's a storytelling process involved at all stages um, of a film's life, whether that's in production or in the way that it's released and how it's kind of framed. Um, but also there's a kind of meta-narrative in the curation of films and the films that sit next to each other. So um, that, that's kind of in a nutshell. The, um, the work that, that I've been doing over the last 10 years. I've produced, I think, nine feature documentaries. They tend to be films that are produced over a long period of time and they're driven by, they're director driven films and focus around uh, a question. A, they're often about people caught up in the reality and in a kind of bigger context. Um, the kind of combination between people and politics, extraordinary situations um, and individuals working through them. And the way that the lockdown has affected me, I mean, well, the first thing I'd say is that when it all started, first of all, I, I moved everything home 10 days before the UK went into lockdown because I think just by nature of being very international, you could already see what was happening all over the world and just felt that this it's it's all happening very late here so i was home about 10 days before um and everything was paused quite early because we i mean you know was technically in production with we're in pre-production with two films we had a shoot in the us that had to be postponed and two other shoots in other parts of the uk and it just felt already from the end of February, beginning of March, that leaving the country was a real commitment because there wasn't really, I couldn't feel the certainty that you'd be coming back if 
something happens and equally that there was this kind of unknown there, there was a big unknown and, and you just there were more considerations around that unknown so in that in that kind of key practical sense I think very early you started to think about what was on the horizon and whether you could justify going abroad whether you could justify people's safety their ability to move around um, I think at the same time there's something around being a documentary producer which is all about um, I think documentary is so much about uncertainty and placing a frame on reality and not not really having knowing so much at the outset and so the various experiences I've had in making films have probably given well they gave me a lot of stability at the beginning of all of this to realize that what I really needed to do is to take a step back and assess the situation before rushing into you know trying to force productions back in or trying to to think you know we had a film um Ayuni by Yasmin Feda who was that was that premiered at CPH which was probably one of the first festivals to go online and it was actually a a very strange and probably quite underwhelming experience to work on a film for seven years and then never really meet an audience and have no idea whether whether it was seen or engaged with but we kind of also then didn't rush into putting it online or working with it immediately because we just really felt the need to think about the situation and, and also counter this idea that seemed to to emerge so quickly at the beginning of lockdown and still now around free films and free access to things when actually this is you know we spend years making our films and it's 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 what we live from as well but it's what we believe in but it's we also have to ensure um that we can keep making films or that we can we're framing them in the best way or that we're protecting um our ability to keep working on them and so um so sorry that was a big roundabout answer but in uh, the lockdown has affected obviously um everything and i think well noah was saying oh you're in production and it's really hard to say we're in production or we're not in production we're kind of not not working on things because it's it's hard to to you you can't disconnect from questions and ideas and people that you've spent a lot of time developing um developing ideas and developing films with and it's also within your responsibility to ensure that both teams and perhaps subjects of films are you're engaging and also um that there's a level of care that's involved um between people and i think i don't want to say that's particular to documentary but with documentary you are working with real people real lives real contexts and you do have a duty of care as a producer, I also have a duty of care. You know, if I'm the person that's managing um, managing a budget, it's it's one way of of ensuring livelihoods. It's one way of paying people. But th these also sit in this kind of unspoken space of what production is. I think we don't talk so much about the um, the kind of team dynamics, the the um, the management of of people's um, sometimes well very often I think vulnerabilities because when you're entering a space and you're questioning something that matters to you often you're you're engaging with something that's meaningful and sometimes challenging or difficult and that is a space of vulnerability and the best films also come out of that space of vulnerability and, and a real engagement with it so um so yes I think so there's a lot going on it's maybe quite different to what I expected to be doing right now um but it's it's not actual production and it's not not production at the same time yeah thank you very much and you brought up a lot of points to mm -hmm. well, Sorry, um, I go off on tangents um and um yeah i have some uh, follow-up questions on those but i think uh one of the ones that i was uh, thinking about also reading through the guidelines is this uh, kind of first question or first step um, is uh, and which is should I be filming at all uh, so even if let's say lockdown is uh, becoming uh, more um, uh, less restricted um, and if you can uh, start getting back out there um, should 
uh, is the story important enough or urgent enough that it outweighs the risks? What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, it's the, so the guidelines I find quite fascinating in a sense because it's the response from an industry trying to make sense of a lot of uncertainty. And the guidelines are actually an attempt to provide frames and best practice where the government hasn't given certainties. And so that's already indicating what a tricky space this can be. Because in reality, if you, if you look at the way that this lockdown has, has taken place in this country, it's, you, you could technically be filming, all the risk is on you. And that's really, um, that's, I, I would say that's quite dangerous. It's quite reckless. Um, anyhow, in terms of should I be filming at all, in a sense, and that's, that's the question number one on the guidelines that um, Doc Society put together with a whole host of organizations. And I think that's a very good question in any documentary situation. I, I would always say that the first question you ask yourself is really why you're filming. And that's, that's kind of, that's your North Star. It's the, it's the only thing that, it's the honesty that you have with yourself about what it is that really interests you or that's really driving you into a certain situation. And sometimes that why is a very personal thing. Sometimes it's never communicated to anyone else. But that is really the, the, the thing that will probably not change because over, over the course of the documentary, so many other things can change. Um, you know, you can't predict, you can't necessarily control. You can make decisions around everything, but the one thing that probably won't change is, is the reason why you're filming. Um, or in a sense, if it becomes clearer or more defined, that's something that happens in the process of making. And in a way, this question of should I be filming sits alongside why are you filming? And I think there's quite a good suggestion in those guidelines around setting out in writing whether or not you should be filming. And it's a good, I think that's a great exercise in any case because it's like this process of, of articulating what it is that's driving you and whether what's driving you is, is worth at, in this space is worth a certain risk that you you'll definitely be taking in a general space with documentary i would say there's always a risk as well because you are engaging with a reality you're putting yourself and other people in a frame and you're taking responsibility for the story that you're weaving about about their reality or, or their story or yours and then it also comes with a certain risk attached to it as well. So um, I think it's a very good question. I think what's very hard about it is that nobody else can know but you, which is why I think teams are a really important thing in filmmaking generally, but in documentary as well. I think it's, it's probably, it's a very lonely space often to make films and to make documentaries. But I mean, as a producer, I'd say one of your you know, your key um, collaborator and sounding board is your often your pr producer um, or, you know, that's the kind of starting point of a team. And, um, and why, why you're filming and should you be filming is really a question to be debated and discussed. And so I think my, my starting point would definitely be this articulation on paper and then a kind of uh, sharing and thinking together about whether it, it makes sense. And, and I think working with people who will challenge you as well and, and will be your devil's advocate to really work through this big question. Yeah, yeah and um, a lot of your, uh, the films that you've produced over the years focus very much on um, vulnerable people or giving voice to people who might not otherwise um, have an opportunity to talk about their, their issues or concerns. So um, I was wondering what are your thoughts on um, yeah, filming in this current situation? Because it, um, in a way, it feels like um, this whole pandemic uh, situation has only deepened inequalities and people who are already living precariously are doing even worse now. So what are the kind of challenges of representing the most vulnerable um, in this kind of socially distanced society? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. I think 
It's true. I, I, I'm drawn to the quieter voices and I'm drawn to people and, and stories that challenge a mainstream narrative. And that's taken many shapes um, in the various films that I've produced. Um, I'll reference Islands, which was a film that I made with Stephen Eastwood a couple of years ago, which looked to give an image to death and end of life. And the, the kind of core question of the film was around um, what we see and what we don't see and who is given a, an image and who isn't. And so we questioned why somebody at the end of their lives and somebody dying wasn't something that we saw. And yet it's something that's so, so vividly imagined in fiction. It's something that's given so many images, but those images are all, I mean, they're, they're generally quite pro problematic. They sit in the space of metaphor, of heightened emotion, of heightened action even, but the reality of a pain managed death is rarely seen on screen. And so when we set out to make that film, it was very much this idea of giving an image to challenging a taboo and giving an image to, um, to something that, we, that we, we don't see, but questioning why we don't see it, questioning why there's no agency given to the person at the end of their lives. Why is it that we think it's better or more ethical, supposedly, to look away than it is to look at someone? Um, and I think it comes often back to the question of, um, you know, for, for us, there was no, um, there wasn't, it wasn't difficult to find people to engage with us and to make islands. It was a very long process. And there was a whole, of course, there was a whole kind of ethical framework that we thought through and we worked through with a local hospice on the Isle of Wight. Stephen never asked anyone this, this question of, you know, can I film you until, you know, can I film you dying or can I film you until the end of your life? Actually, that was something that, um, that was offered to him, you know, as a, it was something that, that people understood and engaged with and wanted to be a part of. And that was, I think it speaks to, to the question of what is given an image and what isn't given an image. And so, I, I am really interested in that space of, of quieter voices. And, and when I think about Ireland today, I think, I mean, it's incredibly moving to also reflect on the journey of that film because it's, um, it was finished in 2017 and it had, you know, various festival um, launches and it was theatrically, theatrically released in the UK. Um, and it always had extremely full cinema screenings. And when the film ended, people wouldn't leave the cinema. It felt that that space that had been given to reflect on death and dying was something that they really wanted to stay with and remain in. And it, um, we started to work with end of life doulas to, so people who's, who kind of walk people through the process of um, death and dying so that that space could really be harnessed in a sense and, and be a safe space for people. And later on, what we also did is we developed a toolkit. So it's used by um, doctors and nurses to prepare for the fact that they will encounter end of life and they will encounter people who will be dying because there, there isn't very much training around that um, with the kind of NHS NHS is depleting resources. And so to know that it, sorry, so I'm going on a long tangent to kind of make lots of different points that I'll get to, but um, the first thing is that Island was, Island the feature film was made. It was made mainly with arts money. It was really difficult to engage the film space with the notion of giving an image to end of life. And the idea of death is very taboo and it really depends who you're talking to. Um, some people will fully engage with it. Some people really, um, like really not want to do, and that's completely fine. But in the space of, of how can you make certain films and which films are greenlit, that's quite an interesting reflection. In the film space, Island is a 90 minute film and you're, it's very much, a, um, it's a film about time, it's a film about pace, it's a film about breath. 
in many ways in the course of the 90 minutes you're given the space to slow down so that you can engage with um with a seven minute sequence of alan one of the four characters who you follow um, until the end of their lives you see alan breathe until he doesn't breathe anymore and that process is something that by the time you get to alan you have slowed down enough to be able to engage with this image and accept it as, as an image of a reality, um, as something that's not aggressive, um, that's hopefully a lot less scary than perhaps you started the film thinking it might be. On the other hand, we also made a multi-screen installation with exactly the same material, and that was destined to a completely different audience. And that was, was kind of the initial um, imagination of what the, you know what this creative project would be um, and that's called the interval in the instant and that space so that the in interval was also was always um, displayed in gallery spaces where people can navigate the spaces they want they can move in they can move out and the sequence where you watch Alan is you know multi-screen so there's a triptych there are lots of different screens there's one screen that's I think seven hours long because actually the filming sequence with Alan was 24 hours long um, at the end of his life and it's kind of expanded in, in that piece. But what's interesting about the gallery space is that it's not policed in the same way. It doesn't have, you know, you don't have, um, it's not certified. There's, the, there's a different kind of relationship towards what it is that you're going to behold. Um, but equally you can navigate that space differently as well. So I'm just bringing it, bringing it up in terms of thinking about who makes decisions about what it is you can see and what it is that you can't see. And when we talk about ethics with documentary, I think our markers are quite, they're slightly all over the place. And I, I don't, you know, I'm not suggesting that we should have necessarily a board of ethics or a list of rules, but I think that's, it's, it's quite, um, it's perhaps one of the spaces that's lost a lot of um, texture in the way that documentary has been stripped of resources, in the way that broadcasting has shifted, in the way that so many decisions are made in spaces that are outside of the creative and outside of the why. So I always find it fascinating that people would more readily ask, you know, ask us about the ethics of having filmed Alan Dying then they might about the ethics of all sorts of things we see on TV and including films that, you know, would be made. Anyway, I, I won't start naming names of films because that's not quite, that's not where I want to go. But I think there are lots of films that have very questionable ethics that are actually, that have extremely large stages and yet, um, and yet where there has been a really thorough ethical reflection because it's touching on something that's more that that's more invisible, that's quieter, that's more challenging. Um, those are the films that that get that have more um, barriers around them, I guess. So all of this was to say <laughs> that um, I think it does all re really go back to this question of why am I filming and should I be filming and and in a in a strange way with documentary, those questions, you really know the answers yourself and you need to have sounding boards to help you get to those, to the answers. Um, so I'm like really distracted by the chat. We will get to the chat in okay. a few minutes. Yeah. I agree, Say there's a, there's a link between increased commercialization and this kind of throwaway ethics for sure. And it's, a re it's, I think that's what makes the current situation even more dangerous for filmmakers because nobody is protecting you essentially. It, nobody, everything is on you. You know, there's no support. The, the guidelines are guidelines, but ultimately it's up to you to make decisions about what you want to do. One thing that's been brought up a lot and I think is being addressed by, or is trying to be addressed by the working groups that have been set up to engage with, um, filming during and post pandemic is insurance. And that's an interesting point in terms of documentary because there's so many instances in which the insurance that you have doesn't necessarily cover all the things that are required when you're making a documentary. And 
there, you know, we, I'm, I don't think we talk about these things enough. I don't think that the way that the industry has moved helps documentary to be properly supported, helps think through the various um, realities that we as producers and filmmakers need to think about. Um, but we are in a very vulnerable space when it comes to the, the current situation. And I think I wouldn't take um, the notion of filming lightly, the fact that there are guidelines and the fact that it's possible to, to do certain things. Um, I think it's really key that people remember that they're completely on their own with whatever decision they make. Um, yeah, sorry, I feel like I, I keep going off on, on slight tangents. So do pull me back, Alexandra. Oh, it's really good that, yeah, you have um, so many kind of examples uh, to bring in as well. And also in terms of, um, yeah, what are the, also going back, reminding ourselves to go back to those first questions of why mm -hmm. we are doing this and, um, and yeah, this perhaps to help navigate some of the mo most uh, difficult ethical questions. Um, yeah, so uh, you mentioned um, this um, with, in term, with islands and how you were, you know, using different types of formats to uh, tell the story. So I was wondering um, if you think under this current circumstances, and, um, if, you know, there, there will be new ways of telling stories uh, through documentary form, new forms of documentary, um, new ways of engaging with uh, subjects, with contributors, perhaps um giving them more agency or more kind of creative input mm -hmm. um yeah what are your thoughts on this yeah well i hope so i mean i have to say i have this slight bugbear that in so many of these so many of the conversations around sorry it's like loud police car um so many of the conversations around um filming in the current situation and post post pandemic let's say that documentary will get back on its feet faster and this keeps being said to me, and I'm really curious to know what people think when they're saying it's going to be easier for the documentary. I totally get that it's not possible to film big crowd scenes or, you know, like big, big um, fiction shoots, but I think vulnerability, the documentary sits in a particularly vulnerable space. Our budgets have been made very small by lack of funding. Um, filmmakers are making films on a complete shoestring so already they're very kind of limited in the resources that they have with the considerations around additional risk additional uh, additional risk assessments additional kind of things that you might put in place to protect teams with all of these different considerations i can't really see how documentaries can really necessarily you know can can easily be the first films out um, unless we're talking about and this is this is actually what most people are talking about um, archive based documentaries and yes I suppose it is possible to make archive based documentaries because they're based on on perhaps interviews with single person at a time um, lots of research and editing but it is really terrible to 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 only I, I really, I'm quite scared actually that lots of people suddenly start making archive based documentaries very quickly and without consideration necessarily for why they're doing that, apart from the fact that that's something that's possible. Um, and, of, and inevitably the subjects that are more easy to green light or get money for are centered around celebrities. And we've lost so much of the texture of what documentary can be already in the last decade. So I, I'm much more hopeful for what you're suggesting around this idea of increased creativity and shared space and thinking about new ways of making things. Um, my big question is who's funding that? Because I, I can't see very much space for documentary in the UK anyway. So I, I can't see that the small budgets that we work with can realistically extend to all of the different considerations around safety and health and in case things have to be interrupted. Um, so I really have a question mark about how, 
how these things will realistically happen. I mean, going back to your previous question, yes, I think this is a really worrying time for anybody um, with a quieter voice in a minority, for whatever reason, that has different vulnerabilities. You know, the way that guidelines are, are kind of laid out and the way that we're seeing this, this situation unravel, you realize that the people who are most vulnerable were already vulnerable. And so in suggesting that it might not be the best idea to work with people who are already in a vulnerable space is increasing that vulnerability. And by that, I mean, you know, so people who might be carers, for example, um, people who are already um, financially vulnerable and perhaps therefore more vulnerable to to illness because they have to work or they have to engage with certain spaces. I mean, what, what's going, what I'm most fearful of is that there's a, certain, there's a certain baseline of people for whom this is just a really strange hiatus. Um, and that they, you know, and I mean, it's wonderful, I suppose, for some people that they can quietly work away at ideas and then they'll be ready to go as soon as they can. But for many people, this is this is not that space, and um, and I am really concerned about that. And so, in this idea of can we find um, creative responses and creative ways to work, I I think we can, and I think that's where filmmakers have always been the most surprising and and wonderful. But I also think we've made that kind of filmmaking so vulnerable that it's dangerous for us to rely on it too much right now without giving it the support that it needs if that makes sense and um i think i will ask a final question before uh moving on to um to other questions from our participants but i uh, you mentioned in the beginning um a bit about distribution and online screenings uh, mm -hmm. so i was wondering um yeah what are your thoughts on online screenings and the the, the potential of online screenings of connecting to audiences on the one hand, but also to connecting to communities or to um, campaigns, broader campaigns uh, around the issues that the films are about? Yeah, I think, I mean, it's been an interesting time to also observe that everything can be moved online and questions of accessibility suddenly, you know, many things that have been very difficult in the past are suddenly possible and that applies also to the space of how films move and how they're made accessible um how you know how so many things like that have always obstructed films from working um on an online space suddenly disappear and so i wonder what the long-term impact of that will be i think i think in a sense documentary has the same issue that it's always had in that it also depends what else is out there. And when there's so much online, how do you ensure that your film gets a certain visibility and is, is able to engage? And that's the problem for documentaries so often at the cinema as well, even if you have a theatrical release, will you get reviewed? You know, Island, when, I, when we released Island in UK cinemas, it got five star reviews across the board. And most of those were not published because there was no space. So we had emails from people saying, this is, this was my film of the week, but I'm sorry, this can't be printed. <laughs> and that's the problem for documentary. It's somehow, well, A, I, you know, the cinema, these spaces are really like slave to marketing in a sense that the bigger voices, the powerful voices, the kind of, the relationships in place and that need to be protected we all we come second i think that there is still i mean i don't know how much people agree i feel that documentary is considered a kind of secondary form so often within the general landscape i think it's quite obvious already just looking at the guidelines that have been put out by the wider industry because they don't take into account the fact that some people make non-fiction in this industry we're part of an ecosystem and yet we just we're not visible in these in these documents so it is wonderful and and i'm very thankful to 
Doc Society and all of the partners that fed into this very specific document. And I suppose it's, it, that's the reason why such organizations also exist. But I, I, I just can't understand why these considerations are never part of the bigger picture. You know, this morning's article in screen outlines the, the kind of the general working groups um, the, the general working group's advice around returning to work, it's for fiction film. Documentary is not considered within the bracket of film. And I think that's a space that we kind of need to overcome. And we need to overcome it with films that aren't just about famous people. Because actually we have had, you know, we, we've had documentaries that have, that have stood the test of time, if only the documentary form was, was more celebrated or, or understood as something that wasn't just um, informational, educational or depressing. Um, I think if we watched more documentaries, maybe people would be better prepared to engage with the strangeness of the situation. Documentary is about perspective and it's about engaging with realities um, that aren't your own, but through the lens of real people. And, you know, I kind of, I think I find solace in so many of the, the films that I've seen, some of the films that I've produced, because they give me perspective on the world. And that's what enables me to engage with very strange situations like the one that we're in. I, of course, I, I you know, love watching feel good films as well. But I think what actually gives me the most in this situation is, is that kind of perspective. So I think that's our biggest hurdle with documentary. I don't think it's got anything to do with this situation. I think it's an overall hurdle and it's got to do with years of, of you know, funding decreasing, there are less and less channels where you can broadcast things. It's very difficult for, um, for a creative documentary to exist. Um, and, you know, because you need to have the support from somewhere to, to to get it to a point that it can be pitched. Anyway, I, I feel like that's going off on another tangent. But yes, for the VOD thing, it's difficult. There is also an opportunity. It comes down to something that documentarians do very well, and that's knowing their subjects and knowing their audience and connecting very directly with people. I think um, online can work as a space of real partnership. And the way that um, we are thinking of releasing Ayuni, the film that I mentioned, we premiered at CPH um, in, with, we are hoping in July, we'll be doing so with a number of key partners. And we, as filmmakers, it, it gives us the opportunity to actually have a com complete control around how the film is released. And that control is necessary for two reasons. One, because as documentarians, and that film is about forcible disappearance in Syria, um, it's a question of security and protection. And two, it's also a question of information. And this is what, um, you know, we can pivot our, what we're doing based on what we, uh, on the feedback that we're getting. So if we suddenly realize that our film is resonating, particularly in South America, then we can, we can start devising more um, strategies to engage with audiences in that space. Um, if we see that there's a large take up of, of, or, you know, many people watching it in France, then we'll think that we, you know, we can do specific social media or speak to journalists in that country and say, you know, this film has been seen 5,000 times since Monday. Um, is it something you'd be interested to write about? So, you know, it gives us that kind of flexibility and ability to, um, to, to work with the film. And that is an opportunity and it's maybe not how we would have imagined we'd release the film, but at the same time, you know, perhaps it speaks a little bit to the ethos of the two characters the film is about. Um, I think talking about it will be a whole other, um, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll stop there. But yeah, I think there are opportunities. I think the bigger problem is the same problem documentary always has is that it's not understood on its own terms. And it's often, um, it is often the minority voice within, within this space. And I hope that changes. Yeah, and I need much. to, stop, otherwise I'll start, start giving you examples of what I think should have been a better film. <laughs> 
Yeah, thank you very much. And um, and with that, uh, yeah, I'd like to open up, uh, John, if you want to uh, read out some of the questions or know if you have any questions to add. Um, yeah. Sure. Anything you want to add, Noe? Yeah, I mean, I guess just to come back to um, something you're talking about, especially around the island, it's, you know, the way ethics, kind of the way we make kind of, you know, films uh, and the content of it, it's kind of, you know, very closely linked, mm -hmm. which means that then the exhibition of it is, needs also to reflect that. Um, a film like Island, where you see someone kind of dying kind of, you know, on screen, uh, it's not something that you want to watch on your television, kind of, you know, in between kind of, you know, your, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> your gin and tonic and, uh, <laughs> and, and your meal. I mean, uh, you, you need that space, that space, which normally would be a cinema or, you know, a community, a group kind of, you know, experience in order to be able to really fully take what the director kind of, you know, took so much trouble working, devising within the film in order to create that space for us to kind of feel it and experience it and think about it. Um, so documentary is exceptional for that because we really need to link all those dots kind of you know, together. We do it while we making the film but we also need to do it while we're showing the film. Yeah, it's so true. Well, it's interesting because we, um, I never, th so we have, Island is available on VOD and that's because of the just sheer amount of people who are contacting us asking to see it. And many people, um, many people were contacting us asking whether they could watch it because they felt that would help them prepare for the death of, someone they loved and many people wrote to us I mean it's one of it's one of those strangely overwhelming films that you every email you get about Ireland is is um it's very moving because it's very much to do with how people engage with the death of loved ones and how people engage with death and this taboo and I'd never I I always thought what you're saying that you know the group experience of watching it and transforming the cinema space into this different space was one of the one of the the amazing things about it but the personal space is also something i i didn't conceptualize it as being as strong as it is but actually it is but coming back to the kind of the gin and tonic and the dinner um when we first started to talk talking to um to hospices and various different um, people who work within edu the education space. Um, um, people were saying, oh, well, can we cut like a 20 minute chunk and show 20 minutes? <laughs> and every single one of those people who then watched the film decided that no, 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 it has to be 90 minutes. And so initially it didn't work with the way that modules works because modules were only an hour long or they were 90 minutes only and you couldn't show 90 minute film and then have a discussion and blah, 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 blah. but everything had to be shifted once the film was uh, was seen because people acknowledged exactly what you're saying that it's not something that you can have breaks around because it's it's told in a certain way so that you can get to a certain point and have a certain space um and that to me was one of the most um, like really validating because it, it really speaks to how um, it, it really speaks to storytelling and this, this question of, of telling the story in the best way that you can and in the way that the subject deserves in a sense. And that, that was real validation that it wasn't cut up for a curriculum that's actually kept as a 90 minute film. Yeah. And I mean, uh, one more point kind of, you know, is uh, the cost kind of, you know, of uh, new guidelines. I mean, how to kind of, you know, working kind of, you know, in the new context mm -hmm. of the COVID. I mean, people are talking about it's going to be another 25 percent kind of, you know, uh, to increase on our budgets. Mm -hmm. But no one talks about where this money is going to come from and the struggle we already have putting together uh, half decent budget to make a film yeah I mean I I'd say half of my films at least have never raised their full budget so 
even the films that I'm making that are supported at the moment, it's really, I mean, it's really difficult. I've renegotiated a lot of, um, I've renegotiated certain things, you know, agreed spend with funders because I have to protect, I have to protect like the, the balance between livelihood and mental health for my directors or researchers and, and recognize that they're all in very different situations. Um, but that this is, you know, they're engaged in a process. It's kind of, it's been paused or has changed for whatever reason. And they can't just not be paid for months and months and months on end while it's not possible for us to make films. But at the same time, it makes us very vulnerable in terms of the future of those films, because at the same time, I, I can't be spending what is amounting to 20, 30% of the budget on this hiatus time. But at the same time, I have to because the film is, is, you know, documentary is about people. Filmmaking is about people. At the end of the day, what, what is more important? Is it more important that we have this kind of, we won't have a film at the end if we don't have people in place to make it. So, yeah, I, I, I don't feel that we're ever talking enough about the real cost of filmmaking. The cost, A, in the sense of are people paid appropriately for the work that they're doing um and we don't talk about the the mental health cost of, of making films like this and the thing with documentary is that you don't stop working on a documentary you know we finished island three years ago i'm talking to people every single day and about the film i'm talking to um palliative care experts i'm talking to doctors i'm talking i mean obviously this is a particular time um, and death is very, very present, but there's a big question mark, which, which in a sense I'm not equipped to answer, which is why I'm engaging with so many professionals around when is it uh, a helpful time to be creating a space with this film? But I mean, I, you know, who's being paid for that? I mean, who was ever paid to make Island in the first place? You know? <laughs> which I find fascinating because actually, if you think about the cultural benefits of that film, particularly in, at this time, um, I mean, the director and I were never paid to make it and we were never paid to distribute it. Um, we're not being, do you know what I mean? So that, that kind of cost, it's, it's not talked about. And that's one of our biggest weaknesses when we talk about documentary and we we have a government that doesn't, care as much for the arts i think that's quite clear they don't even care for the nhs so you know um and we're at risk i think a lot of public bodies are at risk of having their their budgets cut which will mean less money and that will also mean that will mean less you know there'll be less to work with and for those who've already had too little to work with that's a very dangerous space um yeah I don't know who's paying for it, which is, which is why I really think you need to question what films you get into um, and how and why. And I think diversifying your partners as much as possible. So this is the time where we need to learn to do the thing that in this country we've been very bad at doing, which is co-producing and sharing resources, because there are countries that are moving much faster than the UK, um, both in terms of guidelines, protection, insurance, um, you know, there are countries that can much more safely get back to work because their insurance is underwritten by the government, um, because they've got certain measures in place that will protect them. And that's something that we could really benefit from if only we had a, a better, you know, relationship with our neighbours. Yep. I feel very doom and gloom. I'll try and find something really positive to say. <laughs> um, in a sense, we are the most nimble. I think this is the most positive thing I can say is that, you know, <laughs> you work with small resources, you work with small teams, you work often with small budgets, you know how to make money last and you really know the value of it. And you're nimble, you're fast, and you care about your teams, which is why these films eventually come together. But the mental health question, I think, is huge. And it's something we really need to to spend more time talking about. Yep. 
the pressure is not going to go. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, well, we have uh, a few questions in the chat section. Um, mm -hmm. The first one, I think, potentially uh, is relevant to quite a few people here, and it's a probably a difficult one to answer, but but then we'll soon find out. Um, M. H. Kayesh asks or, or says uh, that they're making a documentary in lockdown um, with their family. Sorry, they're mm -hmm. making a, a documentary on, lo on the lockdown situation of their family, mm -hmm. and they're eager to know what the ethics are around making this film. Um, so I suppose that would be relevant to lots of people who are thinking of covering lockdown documentaries. Yeah, Kayesh, if I remember, you're based in Bangladesh, aren't you? Kayesh? Oh, he's gone. Maybe he's on mute. Yeah, maybe on mute. Or... Um, yes, he's on mute. He's kind of... Uh, you want to? Yeah, so I mean, I think film, I mean, it's, it's a great way to, um, I, I've moved to my families as well and I want to make a film every day of <laughs> various realities um, that are happening in this house. Um, I think just with any documentary and particularly with family, I think we assume certain relationships and we assume certain things are okay because they're people who are close to us. And sometimes, and so the question of kind of, it comes maybe back to the question of why, but, but perhaps also a question of, of, of consent and the question of what it is you're making and why you're making it m might be something that, that's good to talk about um, to ensure that you also never know where, how a film starts to develop and, and take shape. You never really know, you know, reality is so much more interesting than fiction, right? Because it's completely unpredictable and, and look at where we're at. Um, you don't know where this process that you're starting with your family in this situation might lead to. And it's good to have a conversation around just expectations and also this question of consent, I think. Um, it can become harder and harder as it as it goes on. Um, that would be my that would be my first my first kind of suggestion. Yeah, but I'm uh, sure that uh, um, I mean, if I'm right, that uh, um, Kayesh is based in uh, in Bangalore. Um, mm -hmm. Getting another reality, another perspective on. Uh, how you know a different culture is living through the day-to-day -day kind of uh, uh, coronavirus. I think it's there. There is value to it, um, and certainly kind of you know should be encouraged because uh, we are all too locked up in uh, in our yeah. little Western yeah. perspective. Yeah, I mean, there's a beautiful short film on the Guardian website called Our. Uh, our Iranian lockdown, I think, that was made by two filmmakers at home um, over the first couple of weeks of lockdown. And I, what I love about it is that it's very, um, it, it speaks, there are so many little nuggets for an Iranian audience, you know, that you'd understand, but at the same time, it tells a kind of bigger picture story as well that's completely relatable because everybody is locked down and everybody's in this like equalized position in a sense that we're all living this completely relatable reality um and at the same time it has all of these little moments which are so specifically iranian um and it, yeah and it's you know it the lockdown started in in iran where most of my family is during Iranian New Year and so we all spent our New Year's alone and separated from each other and it speaks about those you know it doesn't speak about those things it just it gives you little moments it gives you little moments to understand what Iranian New Year is about and what we do for the New Year but it's all very subtle and, and very beautifully done and I'd recommend that as just a, a way of looking at what could be simply done so yeah completely agree with what you're saying Noe about the value of different perspectives at this time and so 
so we don't only have you know like what celebrities were doing in lockdown um we also have records of of what everyone else was doing and people all over the world as well having said that though just like a, a note in that we everyone is in an equalized position so if you are thinking of making a film about something or someone now is really the time to write to them because most people i mean so many people are just a little bit bored and don't really have anything to do and it might be that you get some access that you were never expecting to get because you know we're in a weird equalized position so it's it's worth thinking about what the possibilities could be great and <clears throat> Syed, um you saw that um elm you saw this question earlier and i don't know if you want to expand on it or if you've if you feel you've touched on it it's more a, a statement really it's um so you'd saying that uh, you've seen so many people throw ethics out of the window because of the pressure of broadcasters, funders, etc. There's a link between the increased commercialized commercialization of our industry um, and the defunding of arts at the same time. So I don't know if you wanted to say any more on that or if that just sums it up um, nicely. <laughs> well, it sums it up nicely. I mean, I could give you so many examples, but I'm not sure you want me to go off on another tangent. But yeah, I, I agree. And I also understand as well, because we have limited. You, you have you have to work, you have to collaborate, you have to sometimes work with broadcasters in order to get your films made. You have to work with, you know, it, we're stuck in this space, but I think that's also where the value of a team comes into play you know if you have a director and a producer become this uh a, you know this kind of double act one is slightly more you know it, it, you can play to your strengths in spaces like that and try and push certain things um yeah but i yeah i agree yeah um i'll try not say any more <laughs> to give like examples that aren't ideal in a session. Uh, and um, yeah, this is maybe a difficult one to answer. I'm not sure. Uh, Freddie says, I, I'm a doc filmmaker from Hong Kong. May I ask what is the, I don't know if this, if, if this means differences, but it says difficulties. May I ask what the difficulties of filming between the rules and restriction between England and Scotland at such a difficult time? So that's either about maybe, again, the difficulties of, of filming, or it could be the sort of differences between England and Scotland. I'm, I'm not entirely sure, I'm afraid, but. Well, um, I think I can, hi. It's nice to know there are people from so many different countries. That's really yeah, exciting. That's brilliant. Um, and probably lots of different considerations in terms of, and, and maybe that's where this, what this, this question is also pointing to. Um, I, I mean, I'm looking at Scotland from, the perspective here and I just think how wonderful to have leadership in some form <laughs> it's it really makes a difference you know even if it's just reassurance or if it's an, a question of common sense you know I'd say if there was some form of leadership in England let's say at the moment maybe there'd be a bit more common sense at play when you're looking at things like the guidelines um, I'm not saying that we're all not using our common sense, but I'm saying that our common sense is being relied on a lot, lot more. And that's a slightly dangerous position for us. Um, that leadership really does make a difference. I don't know if you've got something to say about that too. Well, I think uh, in Scotland, having a first minister who uh, talks openly that uh, the GDP of a country is not just about profits and, uh, and money, but also about the mental health of uh, the country, for me, is huge reassurance. Mm. Uh, they may not get it right, but at least it's there, kind of, you know, open, that we have to think about alternative ways of um, talking about the wealth of a country. Um, so far, I mean, the Scottish government has also been very supportive uh, to, uh, to the arts and the culture. Um, and it's, it's a small nation, it's kind of, you know, it's got limited resources, um, but at least we talk about it, the will is there. And I, I think that's, you know, that's how it should be really. Um, 
in terms of kind of, you know, moving uh, or filming the challenges kind of, you know, filming between Scotland and, uh, and England. I mean, right now it's just because uh, uh, Scotland is following tighter rules, regulations on, uh, on the lockdown than England is. Um, so, so the movement is not quite yet opened. Um, and, uh, and in fact, uh, it's very interesting how politicians kind of, you know, uh, are actually kind of, you know, decided that they will carry on kind of, you know, participating to uh, the democratic process of UK via kind of online, as opposed to traveling down to London. So that's kind of in you know, a big signal. That's how we should all try to kind of, you know, to carry on in the next kind of, you know, few weeks or months. So, um, mm -hmm. so yes, there are a few kind of, you know, challenges there to, to be navigated. Yeah, I think just an, a note around um, just notions of, so I think maybe we haven't talked at all specifically about where there is, where if you do decide that you want to film and you think it's right to film and you feel that you should be and that there's a reason for the greater good and, and all of these reasons you you feel that you should be filming something. Um, I think it, it is really the the document that we referenced a couple of times does have quite a lot of consider, considered points. Um, I think kind of government guidelines or not, um, in any situation, it's helpful to do a risk assessment this situation i think risk assessment and that kind of paperwork is not it could be for someone else it could be for insurance purposes but it's really for yourself and it's for you to think through all the different eventualities and documentary is is around placing a frame on reality and maybe sometimes just knowing what you or having thought through what you might do in various situations is one way of allowing yourself much more freedom. And so the, the considerations you might have might firstly relate to the law. And so it's, it impacts on what the guidelines in different countries are, but equally they might, they, might, um, they might be taking lots of other things into consideration. And there are quite, you know, I, I wrote the list, I started writing the list then, and, but actually there's so many things that you could, you could be thinking about from, you know, how people, eating and drinking and how do you ensure that's safe to, you know, what if you need to stay overnight somewhere and how can you ensure that's safe or what's, what's the most you can do in these situations. And to some extent, the guidelines here and there will be, they're kind of, they're trying to be catch-alls. So they're trying to cover as much as possible, but you know your specific situations and you know the very specific things that you're trying to do. And so, you have to do that um, for anything that you are considering filming, regardless of where you are. Firstly, in relation to where you are and, and perhaps the law around where you are, maybe in terms of insurance and protecting yourself and your team on a kind of um, financial level, but maybe more than that, maybe like on a healthcare level, um, but also really in terms of what will you actually do if X, Y, or Z happens. And X might be something that's, minor in retrospect but it might also escalate and become something that's quite major and it's hard to um it's hard to predict predict i i i mean i'd compare it maybe to scenarios where you're filming somewhere where you're not 100 percent sure of questions of safety or communication and in those contexts you would always have devised where you you gen you would always have put together a risk assessment, but you'd have all sorts of things in place like, um, you know, emergency, you might have emergency communication rules with your team, you know, you might have, um, you know, like your, um, what's it called, you know, like a, a word or a phrase that might be said in a situation of heightened risk, for instance, and it might be that you've got to consider things that aren't quite like that, but are similar in the sense that if people feel at risk, but it's difficult to articulate in a certain situation, how do you deal with that? Um, all sorts of, all sorts of things that you might put in place that are very specific to your situation, the country you're in, and what, whatever it is you're filming. 
um, there's, there is a lot to think through. And that document is very, um, it's very thorough. And, and I'd really recommend working through it. And of course, working with local filmmakers is always huge recommendation, not only to avoid mm -hmm. people traveling from one place to another, but because people know the specificity of the local way they live and therefore know how best to handle it, really. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, just to say that uh, Rosie Ellison sent me a, a, a private message there and I'm going to post the link that she sent me and it's regarding the sort of England versus Scotland, if you want, to, want a better term, um, directions. <laughs> Creative Scotland has just uh, posted confirmation, confirmation from the Scottish Government that non-essential activity is still not to take place and there's a few, there's a bit of guidance in this document which I will try and put into uh, the messaging chat room just now if I can. I think Thanks, that non-essential kind of activities is uh, an interesting term really um, because uh, uh, often kind of you know journalism is uh, looked upon as an essential activity and so it should be but mm. my argument is uh, documentary is also essential um, so it needs to be picked on and, and, and try to really think kind of, you know, uh, how to justify that it's kind of essential. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I was reflecting on this question of journalism because so often with some of the films that we make, it's, as a documentarian, it's important to not be classified as a journalist for a question of safety. And in other situations, it is important to be classified within journalism for safety reasons as well. And, you know, it's, it comes back a little bit to this question of commercialization and somehow this like box ticking that documentary doesn't really fit in a space on its own terms. I'd say the films that I've produced to date all are creative documentaries. They're not journalism per se. Some of them have benefited from the filmmaker also being a journalist in questions of safety, for example. But the kind of, the, the amazing thing about documentary is how much, when you watch a film that's been kind of co creatively conceived, there's a whole baggage, you know, there's a whole baggage that the filmmaker's carrying as well and that finds its way into the film in tangential ways, in ways that maybe you wouldn't be, um, you wouldn't be completely aware of, but that are full of the texture. And that's what, you know, development time and space and creative freedom allow. And there is something to be said about using, you know, all of those things take time. And so often documentaries, it takes time to get to the point that you really want to get to. Um, you know, when, so Sean McAllister, who I work with a lot, when he was in Syria looking for a subject, um, and that eventually became the film, A Syrian Love Story, that we made over five years, before, you know, the film starts at a point where you meet Amr in the street, but of course, Sean had spent over a year trying to find someone who he could engage with to embark on that journey of what's the film. Um, when Stephen was filming Islands on the Isle of Wight, there were, it was essentially a question of, um, there was so much waiting, it's waiting and waiting and waiting, and he was waiting so often. And so he was, filming around the island and filming all these different things that works their way into the language of how we established a sense of space and place. Um, and, you know, every single film, Ayuni, which we've just finished, Yasmin Feder's film uh, about forcible disappearance in Syria started as a completely different film. And actually we, we had to keep shifting what the film was in a sense in relation to everything that was unfolding as it was happening and within all of these films there's so much space and there's so much time and that time is also a gift to reassess and to think about what it is you're doing and why you're doing it the difficulty with that time is that nobody's ever paying for it <laughs> but that is really what makes the 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 so often that's what really makes the 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 greatness of, of these films and in terms of the filmmaking it's in knowing to not put the, that into the film somehow 
you wouldn't know that there was a long, you know, year and a half waiting for the right person to arrive or, or, for, or to develop the trust to start the filmmaking process when you start watching a Syrian love story. And you shouldn't because that's not where the story is, but that is what created the strength of that story. So that there is, um, I feel like I'm going in circles slightly, but that's, that's where the strength of, of creative documentary is, but that's also its vulnerability because it doesn't fit into any of these boxes. And, and that's also where we have to be mindful at the moment in particular. Okay, uh, we have a question here from Abby who says I'm in the very very early stages of developing a documentary about migrants migrants covering long stretches often on foot from large Indian cities using footage filmed by them on their phones I'm concerned that I become the very thing I want to avoid being i.e extractive and exploitative um, so it's not exactly a question there but I don't know if you have anything to sort of say on that well I, I think the first thing is the fact that you're aware of your position in relation to and is is it's it's good to ask these questions and it's good to think about how what does it mean to have agency and what does it mean to give agency and how can that work creatively and there can be ways that you incorporate that into the filmmaking process to make it richer and maybe you don't have the answer now but the fact that you're thinking about it is something that that can hopefully lead you to a kind of i first of all a an ethical resolution or an ethical reflection and what's meaningfully what what would be the best way to approach it but also perhaps a creative um a creative idea around that um which which might you know it might be a kind of very visible creative idea or it might be a less visible creative idea in terms of participate you know participatory filmmaking and how you define um, your roles within that space how that participation works I can give you the example of um, even when I fall by Sky Neal and Kate McLaren which was a film we made over seven years uh, about um, the, the first circus in Nepal that was set up by survivors of trafficking um, in circuses in India and at the beginning of the, well, the, the film took a long time to make. One of the reasons was trying to find the right language with which to tell the story. So whilst all of our, all of the, the characters of the film were basically the circus, the young circus and, and the young people um, who were part of the circus. And there was all that, so there was this kind of obvious thread, which was the, their narrative, a lot like a journey might be, you know, you've got this kind of obvious journey. Here it was the process of um, rehabilitation, kind of reconstruction of their lives in, in Nepal, the aftermath of trafficking. But there was a, a, we've, there was a real imbalance in terms of a filmmaking team that was kind of jetting in to make, you know, to film, to record observationally and jetting out the connection to that story came from the filmmakers who are also circus performers and that was very much the connection point with with the young circus um, but at the same time this question of agency was key and it took a long time to to work out how could you how was it possible to give real agency to the circus in the telling of their own story these were young people who were largely illiterate, who'd never really been to school because they'd been trafficked so young. And so the notion of articulating their lives also, you know, through trans, through multiple different types of translation, whether it's onto the screen or in language, was something that we really sat with a lot. And what we came up with was um, a, a participatory process that took into account that the way they expressed themselves was through the body as circus performers and that that gave them the most agency. And so the film has these different moments of um, circus, like um, co-created circus scenes, which tell background stories. And that was the way in which we found that we could give real um, kind of agency in articulating what, what they wanted to articulate. And I, the whole framing of the film took into account the way that the circus 
frames itself. So it was very much focused on the notion of survival rather than victimhood. And that was something we carried all the way through in the way that we were making the film and also how it was distributed. Um, but it sounds really obvious now, you know, when you say that it's a film about a circus and we co-created circus scenes in order to tell those stories, but actually it was a real process to get there. And it was a process for everyone involved. And so sometimes that's something that comes, um, it develops from just asking the question and from thinking, you know, what's, what, what, what are you working with? You know, you're working with mobile phones, you're working with a long journey, you're working with communication in very particular ways. How can you, how can you make those things part of the creative narrative of the film? But equally, what makes sense to the people you're making the film with? What it is that they want to communicate? How do they want to communicate? What do they see these mediums as? And why also they're involved? I think so often we talk about documentary from the perspective of the people making the films, but the best documentaries involve a kind of, um, there's the, the relationship is strong and it, it might sometimes it's very visible on screen and sometimes it isn't but there's also a reason why people get involved in documentaries and sometimes harnessing that reason can also lead you to interesting creative um solutions thanks for that and, and this one i'm going to summarize it a little bit just because it's uh a bit of a long question but it's um it's a it's a really important one and i hope i don't uh, mess it up but um Prince basically, I think if I'm reading this right, says, Prince says, um, the, the character, the, per the, the subject of uh, the film, his film has been um, a dear friend. I think that's Prince there, but I'll, I'll, I'll try and summarize it for you, Prince. And then if, if I get it wrong, you can jump in. But sure. um, the, sub the subject of his film, uh, who he's been very close to for, I think about seven years, mm. um, is now very ill, I think, and potentially quite close to death. Yeah and has been quite a few times. And your question really uh, is about whether um, you should forget the camera, put the camera to one side and be, just be a friend, I think is what you, uh, I'll let you, why don't you say yeah. that? So the thing is, uh, of course, I mean, uh, we've been trying to help him because he's an old guy now. We started shooting this film in 2013 and we've, we've done with the film, but now we are in touch with him and all. But while we were shooting last year, uh, he was having a lot of problems, you know, uh, mentally and physically. So we always question ourselves as artists and filmmakers. Are we doing uh, correctly? Like, is it ethical? Are we milking the situation? Uh, so I just wanted to ask this out, you know, like it's bothering me till now, although the film is over. So I just wanted to ask you since you are a senior uh, uh, person. Yeah. And also, thank you for doing this love from India. Oh. Well, love from London. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a good question and it's a difficult question. And, and in a sense, the only person who can really answer that question is you. And these are the hardest, these are the hard questions that, that we ask when we are working with people in their realities. Um, I'd say, I mean, the first thing maybe is, is around how you talked about the filmmaking process with him and is that a conversation you can have and does it i i i think um it's hard to gauge where a film will go as well and you know it's hard to also you it could be that films can have such different lives and sometimes you know sometimes it's a good thing to outline all of the possibilities and sometimes maybe that's setting up a kind of like false expectation in a sense so it's also gauging what it is that what it is you feel is the right thing to communicate around what it means to be um within a film at the same time film is very um visible and many people have you know ideas around what they think being involved in a film might be but if the, this is a bugbear, then there's something that's maybe specifically, um, maybe there's a specific element, maybe there's something that you specifically filmed that's kind of leading you to really question. And maybe it's, it's kind of sitting down and sometimes writing about it can help just to kind of help figure out what it is that's really, that's making you ask these questions. I, I'd focus really on where you stand and what you think and where, 
you know, the people that you've been working with and your subject stands rather than necessarily relating to the outside world because you know what your film is, you know, you know how it's been made, you know what you've included and you know what you've not included. And that's, those are the things that are leading to your questioning. So, so you're the only person in that position. Um, and, ex you know, an example I'd give, I remember when we first released the Syrian love story, many people would say, you know, it's, it's so intense. How could they, you know, how could the characters in this film have accepted for you to film this? And the reality is that, you know, there's a kind of, it's almost like this contract of trust between people. And the reason why they, you know, they are happy with the film as it is, is because they will live through these moments together. It's, and they, they decided that they, you know, wanted this to be seen as it was. And, and actually there were things that were much more intense that we decided to not include in the film. And I think they also, you know, the, the, the trust goes both ways. And that's why it's very, you know, it's up to you to make those decisions rather than people external to the process. Um, I hope that helps. I've basically thrown it back to you, but it is, it is the oh. big question. Yes, yes, yes. Um, because uh, as artists and as documentary filmmakers, uh, we are making films to have an impact in the society. So mm -hmm. when, if this is a sensitive space to be in while shooting, I think uh, the change begins then and there. And you are right, it's very individual individualistic. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Wow, so we've had um, oh, lots of different countries today um, connecting, connected via Scotland, which is great. Um, we're kind of coming to the end, really, because uh, as I mentioned, um, we do want to let people, if they want to go into, we, we, originally we said 90 minutes, but if people do want to stay for our breakout rooms, that's absolutely fine. If you want to stay another half an hour or so till 12 o'clock. Um, but we do have one, uh, one last question here from Freddie again, who says, um, COVID-19 has affected our everyday, life, uh, our everyday lives and habits already. People seem to think what is the necessities of meeting with each other as frequent as before for business, for cultural events, or even for education institutions. So does COVID-19 and its effect on our daily lives give you a new, uh, a new perspective to create documentary? Mm, I'm not sure I have that perspective quite yet. I, th I think we will have, to it. but I think, um, do you know, at the very beginning of the pandemic, I kept thinking about um, Egypt in 2011. And at the time I was, um, I mean, I, I still, I programmer and I was watching films for uh, Bird's Eye View Festival, at that time spotlighting women directors, but also, um, London Film Festival and there were tens and tens and tens of films about basically the square in in Egypt and it was an overwhelming time and there were so many films about about it which I understand and it was necessary for people to engage with the reality of what they were experiencing which was very overwhelming and and but at the same time when you think about it from now there's so few of those films that stood the test of time in a sense because they were so much about a specific moment rather than well they were about a specific moment and they weren't giving any kind of bigger picture and so it's really hard to know how things will have shifted and how things change or what will change and how our hab habits will change I'd say for, for me right now, I started the pandemic thinking, oh, I'm going to make a comedy about my parents. But um, <laughs> it slowly started to become less funny. It's getting back to the like becoming funny again, but it, I think we're too close still to make big statements about what's changed. And I think. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, okay, well, as I say, I that, that... comedy about my parents too, Saeed. The, the current discussion in our household is that my mum has realised um, that when well, my mum learns that you can become, um, after you die, you can be made into a diamond. So she's like, this is, this is what I'm doing. You, you're going to have to wear me everywhere you go. And people say, that's a beautiful <laughs> ring. You'd be like, yeah, it's my mum. 
this is this is my parents at the moment i'd watch that <laughs> do a kickstarter i'm sure we'll all, we'll all chip in um okay so i think that really is probably us at the end now um thank you so much for all that all of your insight that's been fantastic um i think we covered so many things this morning in just 90 minutes and we could talk for a little longer um noe do you have anything you'd like to say or, or Elam, if you'd like to say anything else before we go into the breakout rooms um, no, just thank you so much. I'm sorry if I went off on lots of tangents. It's something that I seem to do. And yeah, because I can't see everyone. So I, I'm just talking to little screens. Where can people find out more about you? Do you have a website or is, is yeah, Twitter the best place? Or? Yeah, on Twitter. Um, and my, the website is hakawati.co.uk and all of our films are on there. 